everybody. I'm so happy to be here. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about sailing the proficient sea. And I have a song for you right now. <laughs> Come on, you young sailors who follow the sea. Yo ho, blow the man down. Now just pay attention. Listen to me. Give me some time to blow the man down. So, now we're <laughs> Um, so, the adventure of taking our kids on this journey to language proficiency, it's an amazing adventure, but it's not always smooth sailing. But the destination is definitely worth the ride because, well, where are we taking them? We're taking them to learn about other cultures and taking them on this journey through time and space to connect with people in faraway places and faraway times. And we're taking them on a journey of self-discovery and a journey that lets them see their own language in a new way by making comparisons between the second language and the first or second or third language that they already have. And we're taking them on a journey of growing dendrites inside their brains because they're going to be laying down new neural pathways with all these new language data that we're giving them. So it's just amazing. Except when it's not. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes it's like you gotta sink or swim, right? Like for us, it's like, oh, okay. There's so many different ways to do this job. It's a lot like language arts. When I first started as a language arts teacher, it was like a wide open ocean of literacy. <laughs> <laughs> language arts is a lot like our standards. It's like, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to make them stronger readers, stronger writers, stronger speakers, stronger communicators, better thinkers, better people in general. But that's pretty big. And then our standards are also very big. I went to a training for Project Glad, which is an ESOL organization. And most of my fellow students in my group were third, fourth, and fifth grade teachers, and they were like all talking about their content standards and what they have to teach, the, the 23 causes of the American Revolution, the 45 causes of the fall of Rome, and we don't, look, we don't have that. We have five standards, and they're all very like broad. So sometimes we feel like we're kind of swimming or maybe even sinking in this like huge ocean of possibilities, like what are we going to teach? And then sometimes we feel like our kids are drowning too. Like, I just taught them the subjunctive for like three months and I gave them the test and like, they can't even use it. Or I gave them the test and they did all pretty good, but then like five months later, like it's, they're just all over the, the map and like drowning and they, they don't remember anything I taught them. <laughs> and then sometimes there's storms. And the little maids start to get restless on the boat. And, and it might be like a mutiny on the bounty. And, and you're like out on the end of the gangplank, you know, like with your arms tied beside you and like they're back on the, you know, poop deck, like cheering for your demise. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like looking down and there's like sharks down there. You're like, well, I guess those sharks maybe look a little more friendly than those guys back on the boat. <laughs> And then sometimes they have storms, the kids, because like they study and study and they do their flashcards and then like they can't do the thing on the test that they're supposed to do. And, and then sometimes we, we lose some of them. They, they get on the life raft and they like go take, I don't know, graphic design or something like that. Um, because maybe, you know, maybe we're not like retaining our, our crew all the way to, you know, Spanish 4 or AP. Like if we look around, sometimes like the, the classes in first and second year are kind of bursting because I don't know about you guys here, but in, in my district in Portland Public School, they, they have to be there for two years. And then you look around in third, fourth year, and fifth year, and there's like five of them. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of them like jumped on the you know, life raft and went off to Pleasure Island. <laughs> but if you really look at the actual core practices and the actual standards and the actual performance descriptors of proficiency guidelines, we 
in reality, like a lot of those storms don't really even like exist in the proficiency descriptors and the performance descriptors and, and like actual publications. In reality, there's really not any storms in the journey to, to language acquisition. I think sometimes we like manufacture our own storms. We're like nuking the hurricane ourselves. And so like we lay all this stuff on top of what Atlas says for us to do. And that is often where our storms come from. Because if you think about it, like when they were two and three and four years old and they were acquiring their first language, or maybe even their first, second, and third language, I taught, I taught ESOL. Let me ESOL take care of some here. Um, I taught ESOL, and you probably know this too. I had kids from Africa who already had like three or four languages. Um, and they were learning English as a second language. Like we changed the name of that because it's like English as a seventh language. It's still ESL, right? English as a sixth language. Um, so for a kid learning their first language is generally smooth sailing. They're not sitting at home like thinking about dropping out of being five. <laughs> uh, and so why is that? It's, it's because they're using the language to do things that kids want to do. They're using the language to get more milk or get more cheese. My daughter's first word was shh. It wasn't mama, okay? I, I nursed that child for two and a half years. <laughs> but I guess she took me for granted because her first word, she pointed to the fridge and goes, she, she. And we're like, you want cheese? <laughs> so when a kid is acquiring a language when they first, you know, get born, it's not, there's no storms. You know, sometimes they make mistakes. They all make mistakes. They go through those natural stages of language acquisition, just like our kids do. And so they say, go. And then they say went in, and then they finally say went. And then sometimes they go back to went in, but you know, eventually, there's not that many grown ups walking around there saying went in, you know. <laughs> um, and, and nobody ever had to like shed any, well, they probably shed some tears because they're kids, but they, you know, nobody shed any tears over some big test they had to take or like that. No mom, generally, is sitting around thinking, like, my kids saying went in, what's wrong with that? But like, we do in language class, and then we're like, oh, they should know this. And then even people who are like, oh, I, I totally get like the CI thing, like I'm gonna give them CI and then they're gonna like be able to use this adjunctive perfectly after like I'm up with that. But that's like if it is smooth sailing to get to the ability to use the subjunctive, but it's not quick. And then sometimes we like I said, we manufacture these storms. So I drew this because I thought about it after I heard the talk by Bill Van Patten. Anybody listen to Bill Van Patten's podcast? It's great. If you don't listen to it already, you can check it out. It's called Talkin' L2. There's no ING on there. It's Talkin' L2. Because, you know, he's a man of the people. So, uh, Talkin' L2 would be easy. It's a great podcast. And he was talking about error. This is where a lot of these storms come from, right? Like, we're like, oh, man, I... I I want them to do this. I want them to be correct when they say this thing. I've taught it. We've gone over it. I've used it. They've had a lot of exposure to it. Like, why do they all fail the test? Or why do they all pass the test? And a month later, they can't use it. So, Bill Van Patten was talking about the concept of error. And when he says the word error, E R R O R, okay, I am from Georgia, so error, <laughs> mistakes, you know, the fancy word for mistake. Um, he was talking about the concept of error, and when Bill says error, you can practically hear the quote marks in the air around that word, even though know, there's no video on the podcast. I just picked him doing this because, really, in linguistics, there's not anything called error. There's developmental stages, and so he was talking about like, is a tadpole a mistake? It's not a frog. It's dreaming of being a frog, but it's not a frog yet. But the tadpole is never going to become a frog unless it goes through like this little tadpole stage of like, well, I put the legs on there because I didn't want to look like inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> but this is lucky for me and my drawing skill. This is one of the stages that a tadpole goes through. It's not quite a tadpole. It's not quite a frog. Just like when somebody says "yo tiano," it's not really Spanish yet. So. 
oh, one time, so I'm like super active on Facebook. If you want to join this group that I started three years ago, I started this group three years ago with 70 people, and it's 70, it's 7 zero. Seven people, 70, <laughs> no math here. 70 people were in this group, and now it's like 8,600 people. So there's a huge group of like very engaged language teachers. It's called CI Like, So if you want to join that group, I will approve you as fast as I can. But anyways, I didn't know that Bill Van Patten like ever read what I wrote on CI Lipoff until one day when he like actually corrected me. Um, so when he was talking about, you know, okay, well, you know, whatever, at least I got a mention for Bill Van Patten. I thought that was pretty good. So it would have been nice if he was like, "Tina, you're so correct." But then I just like to assume that if I don't hear from Bill, like everything's fine, and I am correct. <laughs> That's what I assume. You know, <laughs> innocent to prove guilty. So um, Bill came out of his, uh, you know, golden tower that he lives in of linguistics and came down and told me that I was not correct when I told the teacher they were showing a sample of their students' work and they were saying that this could not be intermediate low or intermediate did because look at all these uh, errors. Things like TNO, which if you don't speak Spanish, that's like saying I am. And I said to the teacher, like, oh, well, I mean, you can't just not get it down because of the, the patterns of errors that you see, because patterns of error will persist through intermediate in. Like, that sounds very official. <laughs> actual language. And then Bill comes on and says, actually, Tina, that's not true. Patterns of errors don't persist through intermediate mid. They appear in intermediate. In novice, there is no pattern of error. It's just a hot mess. <laughs> no, he didn't say hot mess, but he is the diva of SLA, so I imagine he probably was thinking that. But yeah, if, if you see patterns of error like TNO, like you should be like, woo! My kids are like getting a pattern of error, but it's a pattern. <laughs> <laughs> because they internalize that O means yo. And they hear TNA and like you hear TN a lot like TNA, TNA, like there's more TN out there than Tango, which is the correct way to say, um, that I have something. And so he says, you should actually be happy when you see these patterns of errors coming up because it's like, your little tackles, good. Some little legs. <laughs> so, the problem with like the tackle thing is that it's not quite as like, um, You've ever talked with like, what, what, this is what Bill Van Patten calls presentation plus practice. And he's kind of like, presentation plus practice. But it's like, here's the paradigm for making tango, TNA, TNA, whatever. I'm getting the pattern errors up here. Um, go back to Tadpole State. Uh, so he said, or he calls that presentation plus practice. It's, it's how I learned French, it's not how I learned Spanish. I learned Spanish as an adult, and I knew what I was looking for at that point. I wasn't looking for the rules because I knew that the rules like took too long. And weren't going to get me where I wanted to go, where which was to speak Spanish well enough to pass the test. So like, and there was no grammar on the test, right? It was just the test to be a teacher is like communicative test. You read, you write, you speak, blah blah. So the problem with all this actual stuff is that if you're used to doing presentation plus practice, it feels like the long route. It feels like, how long do I have to wait? How long must I wait? Okay, so how long, you just feel like, how long do I have to wait? Like, when is this journey going to be over? Like, to go back to the ship metaphor. It's like you're out in the middle of the doldrums where there's no wind and there's no wind in your sails. And this is like pretty, you know, like folks that don't go with the wind. So you're just kind of like out there floating around and floating down. You're like a hard tax running low, a whiskey barrel almost empty. What's good? Like, when are we going to get out of the stage where they're all making all these horrible mistakes? Every little pet peeve that you have is like running around on the deck of the boat. You're like, oh, good. So it is a long path. But it is where our national organization is leading us. And it is where like brain research and research into the way we acquire our abilities to actually communicate in another language is leading us. It's just like it takes a while. 
It can make the journey feel kind of long. I'm going to read to you guys some things from a book I wrote. What goes in is what comes out. In order to build proficiency in any language at any level, our brains need to process the meaning of messages delivered in understandable language. Otherwise, you know, it's comprehensible. <laughs> <laughs> this is the only, but I did go through this book and take out more comprehensible input. In fact, I don't even think I used the word comprehensible one time in this book because some people are like, ah, comprehensible input. So I just say understandable language. <laughs> 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 Our brains need to process the meaning of messages delivered in understandable language. This is the only way that increasingly advanced proficiency in speaking and writing the language is developed. We put the messages in, and then we wait. And wait, wait, until they coalesce into usable language and emerge as output. It's kind of like it's kind of like saving for retirement. We have to put in the kind of discourse that we want to see students producing later. We have to be patient and know that as we provide them opportunities to process meaning in the language, that they are also building up their acquired competence. And of course, if our messages are all about culture and comparisons and communities and products and practices and perspectives and all that good stuff, then they're also building up intercultural competence. One day, students can begin living off the interests of all the language we have patiently and consistently deposited in their minds. We have to trust that one day they will output languages, language that resists languages. Maybe I'll output one language and maybe you teach to um, We have to trust that one day they will output language that resembles what we put in. We have to be prepared to give students the benefit of our trust that even if their output is difficult to understand at first, even if it is riddled with error and hesitation, even if it mixes their L1 and L2, that it will eventually, given enough time and more input, move towards more accurate convention. This process is slow and inexorable and also unstoppable. It is like a natural phenomenon, an act of God. Like flakes of snow freezing together, accumulating over time into a glacier, each exposure to meaning extracted from the language gently lays another flake onto the pile. And over time, these flakes fuse into a coherent, deeply internalized system of acquired competence in the language. It takes time and patience and trust to build this system. It goes against the American way. Pop a pill, tap an app, Amazon Prime, that puppy. <laughs> it seems inefficient, but it is, in the long term, the more efficient way, for it is the way that lasts. It's the way that builds a strong foundation. It's a long path. But it's the only way to get to our desired destination, true, lasting, acquired competence, and the ability to use the language to express and interpret meaning without having to consciously think about the language used to communicate that meaning. <laughs> the short path to the long path that leads nowhere else. Many teachers have organized their language programs around the short path. They want to teach and practice language forms and functions so that their students can output readings or a description of their family or camp. It feels satisfying to teach something and then hear our students producing what we taught them. It feels like we've accomplished something, and we have. We have led our students to consciously learn the language. The problem is that this consciously learned language is not robust enough to be of much use to our students. It's not true language competence, it just looks like competence. It is best called language like behavior. <coughs> Practice language and consciously learn rules feel like a shortcut, but they're a shortcut to nowhere if our desired final destination is acquired competence in the language, which can be thought of as effortless communicative ability. Effortless communicative ability. Our students can only reach the final destination by means of the long path. It is a long, winding path, and the going is slow, and each traveler proceeds according to their own internal timeline. Conscious learning feels like a shortcut, but there are no shortcuts in laying down the foundation of true acquired language proficiency. There is a point on the path, later, 
once students have built up a bank of acquired language competence, where we can offer shortcuts and point them out and see if they help some students to travel a little bit faster. Once they have a system of language to work with, students can use their cerebral cortices to consciously learn facts about the language that allow them to monitor, edit, and apply conscious learning to their output to express themselves more clearly and in a more uh, socially accepted way. If we want to teach shortcuts such as explaining editing or spelling moves, or even if we have to work with explicitly taught grammar because our school system still requires this kind of learning targets for our courses, our students will find it much easier to retain and apply if they have a good bank of language in their mind. Then they'll be more like native speaking students who polish up their acquired competence in school, editing their work to be more accurate regarding conventions after they point it to the fridge and say, And mommy and daddy were so happy because the kid was saying something for hours and days and weeks and months and years. And then they get to like third grade and they start doing the scenic path and the winding was a long ride. Imagine that we allow the language to fall gently on our students, as gently as snowflakes, landing where they naturally land and building up over time into a glacier. Imagine then, once the glacier has had time to accumulate, form, and solidify, imagine teaching our students how to carve the surface of the ice into forms that they want to see, polishing their language so that it shines and works for them and does precisely what they want it to do. After years and years of accumulating these linguistic snowflakes, language acquirers can be ready to look at, examine, and work with some surface features of the language. Before that, though, with nothing to carve, nothing to polish, the shortcut of conscious learning is extremely fragile and not worth the time invested. Most of us have had that frustrating experience of teaching some language rules, given a quiz, happily seeing our students perform well on the quiz, and then weeks or months later explaining sugar. They don't remember any of that, we spent a month on it. It doesn't just happen in world language either. I had a colleague down the hall for me when I taught language arts and social studies to seventh grade and eighth grade kids. And she was like a seventh grade teacher. And then one year she had to teach this creative writing at like the it was all eighth graders, and she was much chagrined. When she discovered that even though they spent two months on the commas unit, commas, like comma, <laughs> comma, okay. Uh, they spent two weeks, two months on this commas unit. And I was kind of like, okay, Michelle. Yeah, I, mean, I was always kind of like, okay, great. You're doing your commas unit again, that's awesome. But then she was so chagrined because she, I guess she never thought that they would like forget the commas unit because they spent two months on it. But she's like, the eighth graders can't use commas. I'm like, well, that was pretty casual learning. It's just like presentation and practice in English language art. It's not just us, it's math too. If you have been involved with any kind of school reform in your building, then maybe work with some math teachers. You might have looked at the new Common Core standards in math. I don't know if you guys have this in the state, but Common Core standards in math are kind of like acquiring math instead of learning math. So a lot of math is presentation plus practice too. Here's, how, here's the paradigm. It's not the only way to do this math thing, but it's the way I teach it now. Like, you know, the sandal flip-flop, the boot. So we all have these little shortcuts that work with us, these little paradigms, these little like mental constructs, and they do it in math, they do it in language arts, they do it in all kinds of things. Those are all still shortcuts that don't really lead to like, a, like truly acquired numeracy. So it's not just it's not just in our little corner of the profession that we are experiencing sort of a schism between the Presentation plus practice, become that like factory model of education. Move them up, move them on, build them up more, move them on. And moving towards a more constructivist, like inductive and student centered way of teaching. I have a lot of trainings at um, Teachers College at Columbia University in New York for reading and writing workshop. And John Dewey, who you might know from the library. 
<laughs> and such shows as the 100s and the 200s were in the library. Um, John Dewey has probably been cold in his grave for almost 100 years at this point. Since almost 2020, it's insane. 1920 was just you know, yesterday. <laughs> Teachers College was founded with a staff that included John Dewey, and he was a constructivist 115 years ago. And we're still working to apply those principles today. And I think that's what's happening. In math, language arts, world language, moving towards this like building of the student and not imparting bits of knowledge to them. So we say it's 21st century learning, but it's actually more like 19th century learning. But yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so most of us have had this frustrating experience. Turn to somebody near you and tell them, have you ever had this frustrating experience? You teach it, and then it's like, where did the knowledge go? Like they were good on the test. Tell somebody near you, have you ever had this experience? Go. <laughs> Let's see if I know the loser this season. SpongeBob SquarePants! Where is the yellow torment of these? SpongeBob SquarePants! It's not a gold box, it's something you wish. SpongeBob SquarePants! <laughs> Drop on the deck and flop like a fish. <laughs> I had a French class one time, that's how we like got class started. I literally had a kid whose job it was to drop on the deck and flop like a fish. <laughs> he was the principal son of the high school that the kids were going to. So. <laughs> that was interesting. All right, so all, I don't know, I just I saw a lot of rueful teachers, like, oh yeah, man, I don't have that experience. So it's a pretty common experience. It's kind of like Michelle with her commas unit. <laughs> she was chagrined indeed. That's because, well, here's why. Conscious learning in all subjects, not just language, is fragile, easily forgotten, and evaporates quickly if not truly internalized in a deep way. Better to patiently sprinkle a few more flakes on the growing pile and wait it out and know that even though it seems slow and piecemeal, and even though we want it all for our students, and right now, that taking the natural route is actually the fastest in the long run. It allows us later to teach shortcuts to students who have a system of language to work with, to edit, to polish, and to which they can apply their learning. In a school setting where our students are generally already literate in one language, the natural route, and I'm not trying to, so kids have to interrupt the school and do stuff like that, but a little teacher joke. Um, where in, a, in a school setting where our students are already literate in one language generally, the natural route to academic language proficiency can be dramatically shorter than it is for small children learning to read and also developing proficiency in their first languages. It's a common like mantra among people who do trainings for teachers, like, oh, well, it's the same as learning your first language. But it's not. They're all, it, so it's faster. But even though they're older and it's different, the building process is still the same. It just can be accelerated faster because they have all this transfer that they can do. And the closer our language is to English, the faster that transfer happens. And the larger their vocabulary is in English, especially if you teach a romance language related, um, the transfer is going to be a lot faster for kids who are already highly literate in academic English because Tiny linguistics lesson here. I learned this in graduate school. I thought it was fascinating. So the Norman Conquest happened in 1066. And before that, Anglo-Saxon was spoken in England, which is where, as we all know, English, English came from the language that's speaking right now. And English is one of the, maybe even the largest um, vocabularies on the planet. I don't know if it's still got that you know, distinction, but I heard that one time. So why is it that English has so many words? We have so many words to say the same thing. We have like all these registers of words. So why is it that? 
it's because the Anglo-Saxon people were like subjugated, if you will, by the Normans, the French, and they brought over their language too. And so all of our words that are like very concrete, like house, family, mom, mother, father, hand, foot, head, it all came from Anglo-Saxon roots, which is a Germanic language. And then we got this overlayment of romance. And so, but because of just this social order in those days, the overlayment went into like the more academic echelons of language. And then we, we put it on this base of like what is kind of the here and now and the concrete for us. So kids just have this sort of everyday English. They are not going to find it as easy to interpret, especially romance languages as a student who, who can make these connections between like this academic language they have in English because they control that um, level of our English vocabulary. So there's a lot of factors in like how easy it is for a kid to like understand the audience. But there's all kinds of things at play. There's all kinds of things that actually make the second language or whatever language that they're learning with you, maybe it's their third or fourth or fifth, that make it quicker. But it's still communicative experiences that build that true lasting language competence. If we want our students to develop advanced levels of language proficiency, we must begin providing a rich diet of opportunities to interpret the meaning of complex messages in the language. I would even go so far to say that would probably be using past tense in first year. <laughs> <laughs> in public schools, we have all these meetings of, uh, we have these job-like meetings where you get together with people who have your life job, and um, one of the common events in uh, not only our world language program, but also our dual conversion programs, of which we have so many, uh, is that they get to intermediate mid, and then they just can't make it there. Like, they just get stuck. And what's the, what's the main difference between intermediate, low, and intermediate mid is to be able to narrate and describe in all time frames. It's kind of like, well, you expect that you're not going to expose them to any past tense in the first year, and then they're going to have like three months to start like, you know, being able to use it in the second year, so they think you know, they can start, uh, you know, showing this intermediate mid proficiency or performance. Why not start with more complex messages from the very beginning? And then it makes it so much easier for them to learn it if they have to learn it later. They, it, it feels right for more like. So getting these students to interpret these complex messages is a delicate undertaking, as our goal must be to ensure that these complex messages are understandable and interesting to our students. We want our students to feel successful, interested, happy, and accomplished when hearing or reading these messages. So we must begin with simple language, but gradually start introducing more and more complexity with scaffolding and support as soon as we can. This balancing act allows us to provide the most snowflakes while still acknowledging our students' humanity, their need to feel successful and safe and seen. <coughs> we must fill our, our students' minds with the language month after month, gradually increasing the complexity of what they hear and read patiently waiting for them to begin using the language, and then patiently waiting for their language output to stop annoying the shit out of them. <laughs> I think I put that in there as a joke for Brett Chonko, and apparently I never took it up. <laughs> I did not know I was going to say that when I was eight. <laughs> but I hope you still will <laughs> We must resist the temptation to put our students on the spot by requiring them to produce more language than they're capable of. Gradually, we shift the balance of class time from mostly interpreting meaning towards more opportunity to express meaning in speaking and writing. So, that's the long run. It is annoying. Every single day, on that huge Facebook group, I get lots of, uh, I read lots of posts. Look at these things that the kids are doing. 
They're so great. They're writing pages. It's only November, and they're only in first year, and they're only 13 years old. Don't look. They can't even spell this word. I've said that word a million times. They can't even. So if you fill your kids with lots and lots of language, you will. Okay, just raise your hand. Have you ever cried looking at what your students can do? <laughs> <laughs> My friend Ryan Campbell, who teaches in Washington State, she, by the way, in Oregon, we don't say Washington State. We say Washington. <laughs> and then the other Washington is Washington, D.C. But in the rest of the country, nobody says that. They say Washington for Washington, D.C., and they say Washington State for what we call Washington. My friend Ryan teaches in Washington State. And she was reading some of her students' work and displaying it at a conference that I was at, and she like started crying in front of everybody, with just surprise and joy at what they do produce. But if she were to like pick through it with a fine tooth comb and think like I wanted them to learn this thing, and then when I ask them to sit down and write with no reference materials for ten minutes and they write a page, look at all those errors. So it's like, what are we looking for? What was I looking for when my kid went to the fridge and said, "Shoot." It's like, no, no, honey, that's cheese. I was going to come for a long time. I was just like, hey, she said cheese. And then she got so obsessed with cheese that she had to justify it. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good, whatever. But, you know, as far as the communication went, I was pretty happy that she was like, you know, making the best ever. So we're so patient with our little kids. We take, like, Facebook videos of them now. My daughter's 22 years old. I don't have any Facebook videos of her. But, we post it on Facebook, we call her mom. Say it again, say it again, and then they won't, you know. <laughs> and then our kids, like, out, like, if you fill your kids up with language, you will, you will be surprised at what you see. Like, something, it's weird. Something you said, let's see, one or two times. Literally, one or two times, and somehow some kid remembers it. I've, I've read my kids' writing sometimes, and I'm like, I don't remember, I don't even remember saying that. But like, I'm the only person they've ever heard talking in French, so I guess I must have said it. And then you just remember that, like, it's so mysterious. It's like this black box inside. You don't know what is going to stick when you put the stuff in. If it was very memorable, or it was surprising, or it like created some cognitive dissonance in their mind, it sometimes just sticks. And then you can say tien, tiene, tango, tiene, tango, and then there's not going to go out. So it's, it's uncontrollable. It's, it's wild. It's natural. It's human. It's, it's what makes us human, you might say. Our ability to take this complex system, so complex that true linguistics is not comprised of rare rules. I don't know if you've ever seen this. I saw this in a presentation with Bill Van Patten one time at California, same thing as you guys, but California's. He showed this decision tree that happens in Germany. There, there really is no grammar in our minds. It's a complex, like, more complex than any computer can really do. They're getting there, though. Do you know how come? So it's a decision tree, and, like, there's just so many branches on this tree. Like, it's completely impossible for us to consciously process that quickly. It only happens like on this sort of subconscious level in this weird black box called the language acquisition device that we don't know what really happens in there. But speaking of computers, have you guys noticed Google Translates get real good? Yeah. Okay, so now that they can ramp up like cheap, maybe we should just try to actually like make the content the language you know because like <laughs> that's that's how we know it really but do you know why it's gotten so good so fast in the last couple of years? Because they were teaching it algorithms, and then they decided they would try something different, and they started feeding it text. It's been consuming the entirety of like human communication ever that's on Google, and when they started doing that, it accelerated. Well, if it's good enough for assist artificial intelligence, it's probably good enough for real intelligence. So, back to the tab. I just want you to have a new hope for your kids that you can take away these artificial storms that we tend to put in front of them and make them feel like it's this dangerous journey and some of them aren't going to survive and some of them are better at it than others.
because here's the deal. Some of them are better at conscious learning than others. I know I am. I'm not trying to brag. You should see me try to do math. I'm horrible. But some people are just really good at like internalizing the rules and then just quickly like thinking about them, putting them together, and outputting. But everybody can speak their first language, even the dumbest ones in the whole class. <laughs> they probably speak their first language a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> And this is the final slide, and I just want to say, like, you know, what do we, what do we really want for our kids, and what do we really want for ourselves? We want amore. Apparently, sailors really like Italian. I don't know, like half of the <laughs> tattoos I found were all in time. So, we really want them to love the language and love the cultures that speak the language and love us. Let's be honest. Lonely up here at the top. <laughs> and we want them to love each other and love our class and continue. On so that when we look at our ship, you know, in three years, and we look at our third year and fourth year class that is, you know, bursting with, with young ladies swelling the poop deck. <laughs> and we want them to continue on and seek out opportunities to use the language and not be like my mom. My mom loved French class so much that she gave me her middle, my middle name is Suzanne, and her name is Susan, and that was her French class name. <laughs> but that's all cute and everything. But she never gone to France until I turned forty and she turned sixty. Yeah, I'm really really fast. So she turned forty and I turned sixty. And at the time, my daughter was also twenty. So, um, and for our hundredth birthday together, we go to France and we're in Paris and we were like at a cafe and she had me with her and I'm like the baby, you know, huge translator that she produced and gave the name Suzanne to and just like cursed me to learn French. So. We're at a cafe, and she wants to order a beer. And uh, that's nothing new. But what was new is that it's a pair. And so I'm like, je, I'm like, je, who's there in the air? She wouldn't say it. She wouldn't say it. I kept saying it to her. She started crying. She's like, I can't do it to you. I can't because I'm not going to say it right. And then I go, How did they teach you? I never really asked my mom. Weird. We talk all kinds of things, but not this. So I was like, how the teacher? And she was, well, my teacher used to like ask us questions on the book, and if you get it right, then you say it again and again until you got it right. And it was so my mom's a real perfectionist, and she's had a really good heart. She had a really hard life as a kid. She's really she was so painfully shy. Even when I was a little girl, she would send me in to get the bread at the community store. It was so damaging to her to have that experience in French class, even though apparently she loved it enough to pass on her name to me, <laughs> that she could not speak 45 years later the language, even when her daughter was sitting there like whispering into her ear. So I don't want that for our kids in the future. I want them to feel comfortable and happy. And like they love the language and they love using it. And they know that like if you say, Yo, TNO. People are still going to understand. <laughs> so, it's the same thing. And in reality, there's really no storms. We have the best job in the building. I know I'm over time, I'm sorry. We have the best job in the building. We practically teach a class that could be called breathing. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody can breathe as long as their body's working and their mind is still intact. As long as you've got the articulators and the lungs to press out the air and the you know cognitive ability to use language, like you can learn language too. Maybe P. Maybe. But I don't know, you never see me try to do a layup shot. So we really do have the easiest job in the building. It's just that we have to find ways to like give our students some messages to understand and then eventually they can produce and then it just has to be understandable to them and interesting enough for them to pay attention and not try to like Velcro and then Velcro their shoes instead. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you would like to get that excerpt plus a little uh, comic book thing, I'm a pretty good drawer. I um, so to this comic book guide to the actual level. And if you go here, you can sign up for my newsletter and I promise I won't send you any, any spam. I'll send you like really cool stuff. And you can download an excerpt from the book. That includes what I just read to you, as well as the, it comes in with big media, the graphic guide to the book. Picture of Steve Fashion that I drew. He was here last year, so if you want to see what I think he looks like, you can get those. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you guys.
guys so much. I'm sorry.